soil tests are frequently misunderstood or uh, baffling to uh, gardeners because they are a little hard to interpret. What we're going to do today is uh, teach you what you need to know about them so they're not baffling. Welcome to our YouTube channel. Chip and I plan to be doing a lot more uh, videos for you. If you like them, please click on like and click on subscribe and click on the bell so that you'll be notified every Sunday when we uh, post our new videos. I'm John Valentino, president of John and Bob's Corporation and we're here at a major regional hospital in uh, Fresno with Chip Valentino. We were here a couple months ago. We did a video that you can refer to where we introduced this project that we were starting and uh, we're about uh, halfway through. You can see it looks a lot different than the last video. We've done major concrete work and irrigation work and grading and demolition and uh, today we'll talk about soil testing. So it's traditional on a project like this that a, a landscape professional would be required to uh, do soil testing in more than one location on the site. And then that testing is used to determine what kind of amendments uh, will be used. And usually it's a combination of the landscape contractor, the landscape architect, and the soil testing professional to make recommendations. A traditional test, I, I would call it a traditional test because it tells you everything about it more in an elemental way, whereas less traditional tests, which are available now, would focus on life in the soil. And as you know, with our products, we're focused on life in the soil. But this tra traditional test is actually very useful, although not in the way that one might think. I don't use it the way a traditional farmer or traditional gardener would use it. I use it a little bit differently. It does say that we're low in zinc, uh, we're low in uh, boron, we're low in nitrogen, we're low in phosphorus, we're low in uh, potassium. But I'm not going to use it to apply those very things and figure out ways of looking at everything we're low in and applying it. Rather, I'm going to use it in an untraditional way, which is our theory and what we practice every day in our work is that by building the life in the soil, you address all of those problems. And you address them in a much more uh, compelling way for the plants and the soil. So what we want to know initially from this test is what might prohibit that life, that food for life, those attractants for life, and the life itself that we're adding to proliferate, to thrive. Is there anything in this soil will keep that from happening? The first thing I look at is pH, which is included in every soil test. And if the pH is more than eight, meaning it's very alkaline, or it's five or less, meaning it's very acid, then we're gonna have a difficult time getting our products to work right because they're not going to live. So if we use um, beneficial bacteria and food for bacteria and attractants for bacteria, um, it pretty much doesn't do anything because it's so, the, the soil is so toxic, either too acid or too, um, too alkaline, that uh, we can't get the products to do what they're supposed to do. So that's the first thing we'd look at, and if that's the case, then we'd focus on ways to lower the pH or to raise the pH. And that's, I'd focus on that first if I find that the pH is too low or too high. Now this particular soil, we did it in three different locations because it's a big site and the pH is varied. The highest was 7.5. pHs tend to, this is a broad generalization, but they tend to be too high or more alkaline in the western part of the United States and too low or acid in the eastern uh, part of the United States. But there's exceptions to that. In this case, the pHs are right around 7. One gets up to 7.5, so we know our products will work really well. The 
If you ever commission a lab to do a soil test, always pay a little extra and have them do recommendations because that's really where you can find out the meaning of it. And it's really not worth it to try to go through and figure out what each one of those numbers means, but they will interpret it and give you a broad recommendation. You don't have to believe every single thing on there, but at least you start to get a base of information here. What kinds of things concern a soil professional. In this case, um, the first thing they addressed in the recommendations is the uh, pH levels, which we just talked about, and then the EC levels, which has to do with the salinity of the soil and really impacts the porosity of the soil and you know the ability of water to uh, soak in. And they, in a couple of these samples, it looks like there's a problem. You can see they're recommending uh, compost or manure. What we know we're going to do, regardless of the problem, and I've talked about in other videos, is we're going to we're going to use compost in manure-like substances. We're going to infuse this soil with life. As we've talked before, every single problem that exists in soil is impacted by soil life, which is what compost has in it. So all of our products are full of either life or attractants for life or food for life. So salinity will um, be addressed. Then it uh, goes to recommendations after it identifies what it uh, foresees as, as the problems in the soil. One of its main recommendations is gypsum, which is a pretty common recommendation and one I'm not too crazy about for reasons I'll tell you about now. But um, it, gypsum is inexpensive. Usually it can't do any damage. In some cases it can, but most of the time it can't. But I find it's way over prescribed for actually changing soil quickly and improving hard, compacted clay soil. That's usually, there are other reasons to use it, but the most famous one is if you have clay heavy soil, gypsum is regarded as something that can lighten it. Now, does it really help? Uh, and is it worth your trouble? Eh, maybe a little. I like to quote uh, one of my friends, using gypsum on your soil for heavy clay soil is like using a match to pop your popcorn. It'll work, but it'll take about a hundred years. Now, when we combine the types of products that we talk about in, in our videos that infuse life in the soil with gypsum, it's a different story. You can get much faster results. I'm not a believer that just gypsum is, is, gonna, is gonna do miracles. I think gypsum with other life-infusing products will do miracles. So you see the last recommendation on here addresses the soil report in that these soils that we tested here at this hospital are very low in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are macronutrients, and those are important for plants to thrive. And so um, they recommend pretty heavy applications of 15-15-15, which is synthetic fertilizer. And I prefer not to use 15-15-15. What we want to do is every time we put anything in the soil, even if it's something to address nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, make it be something that builds soil life because soil that's lively can, can produce soil, can produce its own nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium and can solve all the deficiencies that you see on this soil test. So everything we use, rather than putting some chemical on it specifically to address that uh, shortage, we're going to use, uh, in this case, our Nourish Biosol, which is dried mycelium, which is a great form of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but it's also food for microbes, food for complex soil life. You can see by the way I broke down this soil test, it isn't really that useful before we start because we know what we're going to do to the soil because any soil is benefited by being lively. We make our additions we put in our landscape and every six months or so we do the same testing in the same spots and we see what kind of progress we're making and we see what kind of shortages or deficiencies we have after we're infusing it with life 
and, and then this will have much more meaning. And then we adjust um, our future amendments. These are our products are all topical amendments. So we can, even after the landscape's done, we can continue to do topical amendments and we will adjust them based on what those results show us. So uh, a little bit of information is helpful right in the beginning, but really I prefer it more as an ongoing source of information, maybe once a year um, or every six months, something like that. Hey there, friends. Thanks for watching our video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click on the bell. Want to learn more about our products? Then head over to our website, www.johnandbobs.com.